This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Well, welcome to the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam, and joining me today is Dr. Richard Blackaby. Good to be with you, Sam. You're kind of under the weather, it looks like today. I am. You can uh, you can probably tell in my voice that I've... You gotta, just got to take better care of yourself, Sam. I know. I, know. I just got to sleep more. It's, that's, that's the problem here. <laughs> what do you but have? no, when you've got a, when you've got a two-year-old who goes to nursery, um, all kinds of things come back yeah. with her, and uh, this is one of those. So <laughs> yeah, here we fa- are. A family that shares... We are, yeah. We we definitely share everything that we get, so that's uh, <laughs> that's nice. But uh, hopefully, we'll kick this soon and uh, move on with my life. So, um, but uh, before we get started today, I wanted to maybe drop in and ask about your beloved uh, sabers. And well, we I can know move last on time we talked that, about so that, you know, there was lots hit, of they've hit a bit of a stretch here of uh, a losing oh, stretch. A bit of a stretch, you say. Yeah, it's a scratch. Might last the rest of the season, but we'll see. Yeah, but uh, yeah. well, for, I, I just hate to their that credit, their their top scorer got hurt, and they've been they've lost mm-hmm. every game since he's been out, and their top center got hurt in the first game, and so hoping those two guys will get back soon. And their top goalie is hurt, which is a classic Buffalo. Like, if you're doing well, let's let's have a spat of injuries of all your best players, and we'll fix that. <laughs> Well, well, you know. It, but there's still hope. The season is young. Well, so. you know, there is because uh, the, hope bra- springs the, Braves, eternal. the Braves won the World Series this year. Yeah, that's right. That hasn't happened since 95. So we know that, yeah, good just, things can happen. You just never know. You just never know. All right. Well, I just just wanted to drop yeah, in. Yeah, well, thanks. I'll, I'll bring up the Sabres next time I want to talk about them, Sam. <laughs> 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 well, I, I thought you might, but I, I couldn't help it. Follow my cue on that. <laughs> this is a time we don't talk about. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I couldn't help it. But So this week, um, we, we haven't done this in a while, but we, we take a, a leadership profile, essentially, and we, we look at uh, one of the many biographies you pull down off the old shelf, and uh, we, we peruse what a what a life of leadership looks like and, and we're doing a, a bit of a different one today and yeah it's the life of uh, john g Patton, and he was a missionary to uh, the new hebrides and so you might you might uh, think that oh well you know a missionary are they are they leaders um what, what does that look like and we've done a lot of uh, business leaders political leaders governmental leaders um but this is uh, i think maybe the first missionary profile that we've yeah, done. Yeah, I think so. I think. And I, you know, this guy just has several things that uh, really inspired me. It's a, it's actually a reprint of a, of a classic um, called John G. Patton, Missionary to the New Hebrides, an autobiography. And uh, he, uh, he goes, that, and the New Hebrides, if you might not be familiar with that is, but it's kind of east of uh, New Zealand and uh, new, uh, out in the Solomon Islands, I think, mm. is what it would be called now. I forget the name of what they're called now, but they're an independent country. But they were kind of uh, colonized both by the British and the French, and it kind of. But it but it was basically an island of cannibals, and uh, uh, the when uh, Patton gets there in around 1858, uh, it's a it's a horrific place and just of course we can't even imagine now the kind of things that would go on then in that society and and there are times where missionaries have been kind of uh condemned as being colonial and just trying to bring their western ways on different cultures and so on but uh but i i think and, and certainly some of that happened but uh but you, you, when you read this book, you just realize what real dedication to Christ means and willingness to lay your life down uh, in, yeah. in the call of God. And uh, because Patton lives in, he grows up in Scotland. He has, you know, he's not wealthy. His dad's a tailor. They live in a, a lot of kids in a small house. But uh, but he uh, lives in a civilized country, at least, and. Uh, and he's going to feel called to go with his wife um, to this very, very desolate, uh, cannibalistic place where they'll do, you know, set, I mean, they literally, they, they, they war against other tribes and they eat each other. And at times in their hunger for food, they may even dig up buried people to eat. And, uh, uh, and it's the kind of thing where like when, when a chief of a tribe, his little boy uh, died, that the tribe would kill four perfectly healthy young men 
just so that their spirits could go with the the, the chief's son and and kind of care for him, wait for him in the afterlife. And mm. so, when someone died, you you kind of had to be careful. Or uh, same with the widow. If your husband died, you might be a perfectly healthy widow, but they might strangle you to kill you so that you could go with your dead husband into the afterlife. Uh, wow. Just uh, brutal, brutal stuff. And uh, it was just a culture that uh, gloried in deception and thievery and violence and tricking other people so you can kill them and lie to them and so that they're caught unawares. And it was just a very, you know, you can say, well, that was their culture, but obviously it was a very sinful, violent, uh, depraved kind of, sin warped kind of culture. And so this, uh, this proper, uh, Scott, uh, rise with his wife and, uh, you know, why you'd go to a land that was, uh, and in fact, he, he'll be there on the first Island he goes to for, I don't know, maybe about five years. And, um, basically pretty well all the missionaries who serve with him in that area, including his wife, will all die. About five years later, he's the last one standing. Um, and eventually, and it's just, it's just a long tale of, of loss and missionaries being, uh, murdered and, uh, eaten and attacked and killed and, and lied to and betrayed and people they thought they could trust were deceiving them. And, uh, and yet you, you've gone, you've left your home and families and security, and literally given your life for these people and oftentimes just the hardships were unimaginable. And, uh, and of course these, uh, Western folks from Europe would go to these, uh, malaria infested islands and, uh, die just, just a killing field of, of malaria and different types of disease. And these, these folks would arrive perfectly healthy and strong and then just be ravaged by all manner of illness. And yeah. so, you know, I, now and then I just think it's good just to read uh, some of these stories to realize. Uh, and of course, now what's going to happen is after about, I guess, around five or so years on this first island, it, it, despite seeing a lot of good stuff happen, um, it, it just gets so difficult. I mean, he's literally just just wave after wave of you know, uh, opposition trying to kill him and, and he's in lay siege to him and his house and, uh, that it just becomes impossible to you, all he's, all he's trying to do is try not to get killed after a while because of all the opposition that's coming against him. And, uh, and so eventually he is transferred to a nearby Island and he stays there for, I guess, around 25 years or so. And, uh, pretty well the whole Island is converted. And so, it's almost like he has five years of just almost hell trying to push against the darkness and evil. And then that kind of prepares him, uh, to, to be able to actually be used very powerfully to transform an entire Island, uh, later. And so, uh, you know, leaders are people that make a difference. Leaders are people that can wade into dark places and not be intimidated and, um, uh, and, and, and be a light in a dark place and, and change it, change the culture. Uh, of course, we've talked about that as a leader before the, the, the highest level of leadership is, is impacting culture and transforming it. And, uh, and he does that. And so, uh, I, I thought I'd just read a, just a couple of things, uh, that particularly about this guy that just really impressed me. Yeah. One is at the big, and he, and he writes, uh, this book. And so this is an autobiography. Yeah, it's an autobiography, so it's okay. and it's volume one. He writes, I believe, a second volume, talking about the second island he goes to. But I don't, I don't have that one. I'm not, I, 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 I guess it's available somehow. But, but this first volume, through the really difficult times, just I tell you, it's you just as you read it, I just remember feeling uh, like, wow, Lord, I don't let me ever complain again about how hard I've got it. <laughs> Um, but he, interestingly, when he's talking about, uh, he, when he writes it, he has a little forward It just says in my 64th year, uh, and he said, uh, my heart has shrunk from the task, the task of writing this, uh, autobiography 
as savoring too much of self. Of course, when you to write an autobiography, you got to think, well, what do I have to say? Is this just a just glorifying yeah. me and what I've done? But he said, latterly, the conviction has been borne home to me that if there be much in my experience which the Church of God ought to know, it would be pride on my part and not humility to let it die with me. Hmm. And I, and I love that uh, insight. He's basically saying. Um, you know, I, I've had a journey with God and he's taught me a lot of things. I've learned a lot and, and much of it through very difficult, hard times. And it's kind of a shame to have a lifetime of learning and then it all dies with you. Yeah. It's as if none of that, everyone has to learn all of that all over again because none of it was shared, recorded. And I think that is one of the reasons why, whether you write an autobiography or not, but just put down on paper somewhere what God's teaching you, yeah. and whether it's a journal, uh, whether you write blogs, whether you post some things on social media. But I, I you know, if you have like a Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever account that you're posting stuff in, uh, when, when God shows you something, maybe even in just your quiet time, take a moment just to write it down or, and, and post it somewhere. And you never know anyone around the world could pick it up and be blessed because you took a moment to share what you learned. It's, you know, there's a condescending, prideful way of sharing stuff. And then yeah. there's just a humble way of saying, hey, I learned this and might have even been the hard way, but I just wanted to put it out there because it might save someone some of the grief it took me uh, to learn it. Yeah, well, you know, that's the, the sort of sneaky thing about pride is, you know, pride can... can appear to be humility but but really what you're doing is you're robbing uh, those around you of of the insights that you've gained and i think how many people just never shared what it is that that they learned whether it's in business or or ministry or life or what have you just because they you know you feel that well it's nobody wants to hear what i have to say yeah or i just feel awkward talking about myself but but pride is really it is kind of a self centeredness and yeah. sometimes we think too much about ourselves, and we're so worried about appearing prideful that we that's a form of self-centeredness we're, <laughs> right, we're absorbed right. with ourselves and what people will think i just wanted to take a few minutes to highlight one of the many resources at blackabystore.org this is where we house all of uh, Blackaby material and the one i want to talk about today is the Blackaby study bible Uh, This study Bible gives you the results of the Blackaby family's approach to Bible study and encourages you to be available for an encounter with God in His Word. Unique notes and articles throughout the Bible give you guidance for experiencing dramatic, life-changing God encounters on a daily basis. It's on sale now for $35. You can pick up your copy at blackabystore.org. Links will be in the show notes. So let me just read a couple of things. I, one part of the first part of the book that just so impacted me is that the, this guy, you know, you know that he's this fearless missionary who uh, literally is, is sur- will find himself surrounded by cannibals all wanting to kill him on a number of occasions, and God will miraculously spare him, and he'll start a, a church, and he'll see converts, and he'll translate scriptures, and eventually is used to. To bring to evangelize an entire island of former cannibals, but uh, but if you ask him, you know what were the influences in your life, he's going to say it was his father. And uh, what's interesting is that his father wanted to be uh, a pastor, a missionary himself. He loved God, was very devout, and he's a kind of a strong Calvinist. And and he doesn't really explain it. He just says I, he longed to be a minister, but God never. Uh, gave him the freedom to do that. And I, I don't know what all that means. It just, he wanted to be called and he just never felt that he was called. And so, so uh, his father had prayed, God, if you give me children, especially in that day, you know, primarily you thought if he had a son who could yeah. go off to the other side of the world, that he would dedicate him to the Lord. And so this John, I, th- I believe is his oldest son. And uh, sure enough, he feels called. And so even though his father loved him dearly, he was so proud that what he was unable to do, his son ultimately mm. would. But what's interesting is that they live in this small house. The dad is a tailor. 
They don't make a lot of money, but very devout. Um, and so I want to just read a couple of excerpts from the book uh, because this because it's such a small house, and I think they had about eight kids. He converted this little space, I think kind of under a stairwell, into a tiny little apartment. And it was the, the father's prayer closet. And, and he would go in there, and I think he prayed out loud typically. And so you could hear the sounds of the dad praying uh, uh, throughout the day, whenever he'd go back there. Um, and so it's called the closet. And let me just read, it, it's got a, this is sort of a bit of old school English, uh, but I, it's sort of, uh, to me, I don't know, I just found it charming. He says, the closet was a very small apartment betwixt the other two. I, I love that word, betwixt. <laughs> There's like two main, main rooms and this closet sort of in the middle. Having room only for a bed, a little table, and a chair with a diminutive window shedding diminutive light on the scene. This was the sanctuary of that cottage home. Thither daily, (laughs) and oftentimes a day, generally after each meal, we saw our father retire and shut the door, shut, shut to the door. And we children got to understand by a sort of spiritual instinct, and he says in brackets, for the thing was too sacred to be talked about. The prayer was being poured out, or prayers were being poured out there for us as of old by the high priest within the veil in the most holy place. We occasionally heard the pathetic echoes of a trembling voice pleading as if for life, and we learned to slip out and in past that door on tiptoe, not to disturb the holy colloquy. The outside world might not know, but we knew whence came that happy light as of a newborn smile that always was dawning on our on my father's face. It was a reflection from the divine presence in the consciousness of which he lived. Never in temple or cathedral or on mountain or in glen can I hope to feel that the Lord God is more near, more visibly walking and talking with men than under that humble cottage roof of thatch and oak and wattle. Though everything else in religion were by some unthinkable catastrophe to be swept out of memory or blotted from my understanding, my soul would wander back to those early scenes and shut itself up once again in that sanctuary closet and have, in hearing still the echoes of those cries to God would hurl back all doubt with the victorious appeal. He walked with God. Why may not I? Uh, and so, mm. you know, just to imagine the, the, uh, challenge of that, just, he's a, he's a, a tailor. He just, he works with his hands, uh, doesn't make much money, but he is devoted to God and, and doesn't realize that his kids are all growing up to watch him. And, um, and, and he says, uh, that, that all of his kids, um, basically none of them ever questioned the faith. They basically having a dad walk with God so closely convinced all eight of them that there was a God and they wanted to know him the way their father did. Uh, it took, I guess they'd get on a horse and buggy or something, a wagon. And it was about a four mile ride into church each time. And he said, each of us from very early days considered it no penalty, but a great joy to go with our father to the church. Uh, I guess there were 11 children, and he said none of them begrudged uh, the faith. Um, uh, he, he, and, and what's interesting is even when the father had to discipline his kids, he typically would, before he would lay a hand on them or do anything, uh, he'd retire to the sanctuary and basically plead with God to know what he should do. He didn't, he didn't want to discipline his child an ounce too much or too little than what God yeah. felt was right. And so he says, the very discipline through which our father passed us was a kind of religion in itself. If anything really serious required uh, us to be punished, he retired first to his closet for prayer. And we boys got to understand that he was laying the whole matter before God. And that was the severest part of the punishment to bear. We loved him all the more when we saw how much it cost him to punish us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just, uh, you know, it's just a really amazing uh, and he talks about just family worship where they would pray every morning, every evening. And he said, uh, when on his knees and all of us kneeling around him in family worship, he poured out his whole soul with tears for the conversion of the heathen, uh, uh, would to the service of Jesus. And for every personnel, personal and domestic need, we all felt as if it, 
in the presence of the living Savior and learned to know and love him as our divine friend. As we rose from our knees, I used to look at the light of my father's face and wish I were like him in spirit. Mm. Uh, and so just a really a powerful story. Um, and he said to his father would say, Oh, my children, love your heavenly father. Tell him in faith and prayer all your needs, and he will supply your wants so far as it shall be for your good and his glory. Um, I uh, And it's interesting when finally Patton uh, is going to leave home and go to the big city uh, to, to go to school and, and prepare uh, for his missionary career. His father walks with him the first six miles. I guess he's going to walk uh, to where he's going. And so his father walks with him six miles. And he said it was just a sacred time because he knew his father loved him very much. Um, and he said some, sometimes they didn't uh, you know, even talk. It was just a sacred moment. And, uh, and of course, John Patton doesn't want to let his father down. When finally they part after about six miles, he says, I watched through the blinding tears till, uh, till, his, till his form had faded away uh, from my gaze. And then hastening on my way, vowed deeply and oft by the help of God, to live and act so as never to grieve or dishonor such a father and mother as he had given me. So mm-hmm. I, I just get, I, I always get moved by that to think, how, how could you live as a parent in such a way that your kids watching your walk with God would just say, I, I can't disappoint that, that father, that yeah. mother. And, um, you know, and, and that was a lot of how I really was raised. I, I didn't agree with everything my parents did, but I, uh, you know, I, I think especially with my dad, his walk with God was such that uh, even though we, we had to kind of find our own way as kids and teenagers, yet we, we, we never doubted the, the reality of God just by, because of watching our parents. Um, and, he, and so when he begins to feel like he may be being called into ministry, uh, Patton says, I was dreadfully afraid of mistaking my own emotions for the will of God. And so, you know, in that kind of strong Calvinist uh, bent, even though he wants to be called, he wants to serve God, he still knows that I can't let my emotions take over. I can't just do it because I really feel strongly. I've got to know that God's calling me. Uh, So he said, nothing so clear the vision and lifts up the life as a decision to move forward in what you know to be entirely the will of God. So he said, once I knew God was calling me, then uh, he said he, that, and of course, he's going to end up surrounded by cannibals who want to kill and eat him on numerous occasions. And if you didn't know you were there because God called you, then uh, you, yeah, you wouldn't you'd have give the up. resolve to, um, to stay. But uh, it, what, what was interesting is that uh, when, when, he, when Patton announces he's going to go as a missionary to this island of cannibals, he has a number of people, even some older Christians, who just urge him not to go. They said, one, one old man said, you'll be eaten by cannibals. And uh, in a kind of a, a graphic kind of response, uh, Patton says, well, you're, you're going to die here and be eaten by worms. He said, so we're all going to be eaten. He said, just, I might as well be eaten by cannibals, laying my life down for God, than just eaten by worms because I played it safe all my life mm-hmm. and then died anyway. Uh, and so his when he told his parents about that, that's when they basically said, well, we prayed all your life that God would call you. And so we, we love you dearly. We certainly don't want you to die a uh, horrible death, but we're proud and we, we have to release you. And the dad said, and we pray all our, with all of our heart that thy, thy Lord, the Lord may accept your offering, long spare you and give you many souls for your hire. Um, and of course, just a very challenging thing. He, it's interesting when he, um, uh, when he does go, uh, when he kind of starts out his career, uh, one of the first things he does is he, if, if, before he, he goes overseas is to be, to be uh, a school teacher. And he goes into this rough and tumble kind of country school, like a one room schoolhouse. And it's just filled with these farm boys who don't want to be there and they're, they're defiant. And when he gets there, the, these same big, big boys, uneducated, uh, have run off three teachers that year. And that's kind of a, a, a matter of pride to them that they can scare off whatever teacher comes. And, uh, so when Patton gets there the first day, the, 
headmaster gives him a big cane and says, you might need this. <laughs> and so okay. so uh, Patton kind of says, well, you know, maybe as a last resort, I just want to love these kids into to, to wanting to learn. But right off the bat, this the biggest kid there uh, defiantly just is laughing and talking and refusing to obey and to be quiet. And he's just disrupting the whole, there's no way you can do school with him. And, and Patton tries to reason with him and plead with him to give a chance. And he just obviously d- is angry about even having to be in school. So finally Patton goes to the back door, locks it and, <laughs> and pulls out the cane. And the, and the farm boy c- goes after him. Like he's with his fist drawn. He's like going to, have it out with the teacher and beat beat the teacher up but Patton beats him into submission to the point that uh he then Patton just looks at all the other boys in the class says who who's ready next and and basically says uh he said I I I, I refuse to be conquered I I I intended to conquer and uh and within a week or two he has sort of proven his mettle and um mm-hmm. through a number of little tricks there were two boys who kind of climbed back into this uh coal storage area door and locked the door and then just kept making all kinds of animal sounds and noises and just trying to disrupt the class. And so Patton finally just gets all the students up and uh, pretends to march them all out of the room uh, for a little field trip activity. And when the boys in the closet think that they're gone, they open the door and come out and then Patton grabs them and beats them. (laughs) And, uh, and they and and that that's the end of that antic. And so it was pretty pretty brutal for a week or two. Yeah. But by by within about two weeks, all the kids love him. Now that he's gotten discipline and now he's gotten their attention, and they develop a love for learning. And uh, interestingly, he just had the attitude of, "I'm gonna, if God's called me here, I'll do whatever it takes, and it might not be pleasant. I'll just pray for strength and wisdom." Uh, and, uh, and so he, he gets to, uh, to New Hebrides, to the island. And back then the, the missionaries didn't even, they didn't know a lot of how even illness spread and so on. And so they, they build their little cottage, uh, down by the, the water in, in a low part of the land. And his wife, it's in rainy season. That's it's the sixth season. No one warned them to say, "Hey, that's the m- most unhealthy time uh, of the year when the most diseases are caught." And his wife's pregnant, and uh, uh, and he'll later realize uh, after he's been there a while, uh, a native will say, "Well, you need to you need to build your." cottage on a hilltop where there's fresh air blowing and not down in the bottom where everything just sort of s- sits there. Stagnates. And so, but by then his wife dies, uh, she gives birth and then dies a day or so later. And then the child dies. And so he's barely been there. Um, and, uh, he, and he's, and he's asked about, he, now he says he wishes he'd left his wife in a healthy place, at least till she delivered the child and so on. And all was well. But, uh, but he says, but she would have none of it. I mean, she insisted on going with them and she was a fearless person herself. She gave her life early on, but, um, she wanted to be there with him and they were healthy when they, when they arrived. It's just that, you know, malaria and those diseases can, can rob you of health pretty quickly. Uh, and so he, uh, just interesting. He, they, they start reaching out first. They don't know the language, of course, and they've got to figure that out, um, but uh, and, and 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 he says it, one of the things that was just also just really sad was that um, uh, the the there were white uh, traders, you know, sailors that would come through and trading stuff with the natives, and uh, he said, but they were just such for the most part the sailors were just the merchants were very corrupt, and uh, he said they the the natives learned all their vices and none of their virtues, and mm. and so the white people would lie to them tra- tra- at one point when they, the, the white traders were just uh, feeling like there were just too many cannibals here to, to, to deal with. They actually put four sailors onto shore in different parts of the island who all had measles. And of course the measles spread all over the island It killed a quarter of the population. They, they intentionally did that just to reduce the number of people. And uh, just the kind of things that they would do then um, would 
would just, uh, you know, mortify us, but, uh, it was just such a brutal world. And so he said, you know, I had white skin too. So they just assumed I was like the sailors and, and I kept trying to convince them. I, I love you. I, I laid my life down for you. And he of course said some things that, uh, that were, that have been said by others as well. Um, he said, uh, I, even when he's completely surrounded by cannibals, they're raising their weapons. It's obvious that they want to kill him, but something will just not really basically the, the, the God will just spare him. Just he'll say, they were all trying to look to each other. Like you, you take, you strike the first blow. You, you hit him first. And something would just with, with hold their hands. They just couldn't do it. And he'd walk away and he knew full well that, they full, they they had murdered many people before. It wasn't like they couldn't do that to him as well. They wanted to, but something restrained mm-hmm. them. And he said, I, I left all in his hands and, and felt immortal till my work was done. And I've heard that phrase used in various ways. You're, you're immortal until you've completed what God has for you on earth. And so he just felt like as long as God's got something still for me to do, he'll protect me and keep me safe. And, uh, and so he... Uh, so he stays there and just, there's just many, many, uh, just amazing stories. And one of the things that's interesting that bothers him the most though, as is what he calls the armchair Christians back home who, who have all kinds of opinions and criticisms of how he's conducting ministry. And you, as you read his story and you read what he's up against, um, you just realize these people have no idea, uh, and w- with all these cannibals trying to kill him, the, the the armchair people are saying, "Well, he just must have provoked them, and uh, and you know, just he must have stirred it up." They, these these sweet natives probably wouldn't do such a thing unless he had done something to them first, and uh, and it, that that bothered him at times. Just the people that had never hardly traveled outside their county, criticizing what he was doing on an island yeah. inhabited by by cannibals. Uh, and, uh, he, um, he, he is, it, he has a, a number of things. He says, though I am by conviction, a strong Calvinist, I'm no fatalist. And so by that, he just meant that he would take precautions as best he could. He would try to protect himself and try to, you know, not just needlessly yeah. become a martyr. Uh, but he also knew that there's really nothing he could do, uh, that would ultimately keep him alive yeah. if God were not helping him. And uh, he he has just one or two last quotes maybe to share. He, he his life is spared a number of times, and he says, uh, "Did ever mother run more quickly to protect their crying child in danger in dangerous hour than the Lord Jesus hastens to answer believing prayer?" Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said, "Truly, all are safe who are in God's keeping." Um, and so, um, and and he kind of. When he, when he kind of summarizes just his own experience, he says, Yet I could never say that on such occasions I was entirely without fear. Nay, I have felt my reason reeling, my sight coming and going, um, and my knees smiting together when thus brought close to violent death, but mostly under the solemn thought of being ushered into eternity and appearing before God. So he says, Yeah, I was oftentimes afraid of dying, but it was not so much the dying part. It was giving an account to God on the other side of dying yeah. that made me tremble to, to say, am I ready yet? Am I prepared? And, and so a lot, a uh, lot to be said, uh, yeah. about this guy, but, uh, just a very, very powerful story of, of an ordinary person. You know, he doesn't hold himself up to be a saint and, and, Really, when you just read the the evil, the darkness of basically, and it's not just a Western kind of like, oh, our culture is just way better than, than that culture. It's more when you're eating other people and you're killing your own daughter for, for dinner and you're killing your, you know, your your sister because her husband died and you don't want the husband, you want the husband to go into the afterlife with his wife. Uh, just the fear and the terror and the the cheapness of life. Um, they and uh, at one point when there there's a war going on between two tribes, uh, the tribe some guys will come back and they see a bunch of kids that have been left behind that they're, they're belong to them, and so they'll 
they try to load all the kids on the boats that they can, and then their own children, they, they, when there's no room for any more, they just kill the remaining children so that they don't fall into the hands of their enemy. And you just, you know, you just see the, this how a depraved sin can make people where they don't value life, even of their own family members. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just in that culture, it was a very chauvinistic kind of uh, culture that, you know, if your wife displeased you, you basically could kill her and it was acceptable. And so he comes in to say, listen, I don't, you, you can dress how you want. You can sing what you want, but you, this is just, this is depraved when you treat each other and kill each other. And, uh, and so for him to do that, but you just think to yourself, boy, I'd, you know, Scotland's a beautiful country. It's a lot of churches would have happily had him minister to them there. And, and, and people said that to him, well, why don't you, they, at one point they were saying, well, you know, there's lots of heathen here in our land. Why do you have to go over to a cannibal island? Why don't you just minister to the heathen here? And his comment at times, he'd get a little, little, caustic himself about those kind of people but he would say uh people that typically say that don't they don't minister to the people next door to them but they but they try to say well that's why i don't go overseas because there's so many people here and his comment was well how many of the people here have you reached and you're not doing that either so yeah don't don't criticize me if i'm prepared to travel to the other side of the globe uh because someone they, they don't have anybody to tell them and they don't have any church around them. And so you read that and you just think, you know, I, I, there's lots of ways we can kind of excuse uh, perhaps our own uh, lack of effort or lack of commitment or how easily we might be discouraged. And I think now and then it's just, it's good to just read about people that just felt like this is what God wanted them to do. And so no matter how hard it was, I, I deal with pastors who have some tough situations in their church, uh, deacons, elders that are giving them grief and, uh, you, you, you know, some carnal Christians in the church and church members, but, uh, it, it honestly doesn't begin to compare to the severity yeah. of what he faced here. And yet, uh, he, and he doesn't try to make it sound easy. I mean, he, he, he paints it in pretty stark colors, but he says, but that's what God wanted me to do. And so God gave me the strength, God protected me and, uh, and I stayed faithful. And, and ultimately after a, very difficult season of basically losing every every one and everything. God then puts him in a place where there's a great harvest, and you you always kind of think to yourself, what if he had quit before the harvest had come? And what if yeah. I mean, he certainly would have been justified in quitting. No one would have blamed him. No, but uh, but I think God knew as, and it just it's really the story of the cross. It's you know, God knew that only through a cross could humanity be saved. And in many cases, that's still the case today. There's yeah. a cross to be uh, that's involved if certain people are ever going to be one. And and some of God's followers have got to be willing to take up their cross and pay the price so that that happens. And and we're in an increasingly dark culture and age ourselves. And mm-hmm. it, this kind of suggests that there'll be a price to pay as well uh, to reach this culture. Uh, and so just a, a different kind of book, but... You know, I just encourage you as a Christian, if you're listening to this podcast, now and then you just need to get, I'd never even heard of John Patton, um, and I'm almost kind of embarrassed about that. When when you read about the, the lengths that Christians have been willing to go for the gospel, yeah. uh, it, you, and, you, and then I didn't even know who they were, and yet the kind of things they endured, it just made me realize I at least owe it to them to learn their story and uh, and let their life challenge me uh, yeah. in a fresh way in, in my day and in the assignments that God has given me. Well, as always, we'll leave links to uh, to that book in the show notes, and hopefully you can pick up your own copy. And uh, once again, Richard, we appreciate um, the time taken to introduce us to John Patton and a, a fascinating and, and courageous life uh, indeed. And so we'll leave it there. And until next time. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners, so email us at podcast at blackme.org.